want to convince you is that, or I want to introduce you to, is a revolution happening in the music industry in China and why this is relevant for people who want to reach those young millennials. So uh, before I go into what's happening in the music business, I think you have to have a sense of what I'm talking about, what I'm feeling, and why I got engaged into China and doing what I'm doing. I'm going to go straight to my presentation now. Uh, basically, this is not really a view or a vision that people have of China and Chinese youth and what they're doing. So it's really casting an eye on the type of consumers that you're probably trying to reach and that they're actually much more complex and diverse than you may imagine. So uh, I started working in the music industry in 2008, uh, 2009. And people for years would ask me, so what's the music industry like in China? And I think these two movie posters best describe what I felt like it was like. Uh, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, and Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, basically, there was rampant piracy everywhere. And uh, that's not to say that there wasn't money to be made. China Mobile was making a lot of money, for example, on ringtones. Uh, but the labels were getting about 5% of the retail that the consumer was paying. So that's the bandits. So you're either dealing with pirates or bandits. But things changed in China. Um, I'm taking 2013 as a start date for change. You can right here notice how much the recorded music industry, so this is what the copyright holders are getting, how much it changed from 2013 to 2015. And China itself went from 21st largest music industry uh, market for recorded music in the world and advanced to 14 and is continuing its progression. Uh, it's estimated that maybe by 2030, it will be the biggest music market in the world, eclipsing the United States and Japan. Uh, digital music industry compounded annual growth rate was 28.5% according to Nielsen. So why, what happened? What happened from the days of the two posters I showed you? Um, an important one was government policy. Uh, there had been a lot of pressure from the USTR in the US, the EU, for China to basically respect copyright. And what they did was update their copyright laws, but more importantly, they did enforcement. So they shut down, for example, about 200 pirate sites. But more importantly, the biggest pirate of them all was actually Baidu, which had an MP3. You could search for any song and get links to the MP3 on the internet. So they forced um, the different providers who were providing music to actually that all the music that they were providing had to be licensed. So if you go on QQ Music or NetEase, Wangyi, or any of these services, 
all the music you're listening to actually is licensed from the copyright holder. Uh, market consolidation, I'll get into that a little later, but in 2014, for example, uh, Xiaomi, which was one of the leading uh, music providers at the time, was bought by Alibaba. And China Music Corporation, which is one of the biggest owner of Chinese music repertoire, brought Kugo and Kuo, which were leading uh, music streaming services. Finally, of course, there is the consumer. There's a shift to the smartphone that happened in China. I don't have to say more about that. Uh, lower mobile data cost, and of course, increased connectivity. So where are we at now? Well, really, China is a mobile music market. In 2015, you can, see, you can actually see how the mobile music market is increasing dramatically from 2015 to the estimated for 2016. 70% uh, of online music listeners listen to music through their phone. And 64.5% have two to three apps, 40% uh, having two apps, about 24.5 having three music apps. And 60% uh, of music listeners are actually accessing those apps daily for one to three hours. QQ Music, which is the largest uh, music provider, streaming provider, has 200 million active monthly users. And Tencent has 15 million paid music subscribers, which makes it the third largest in the world after Spotify and Apple Music. So, uh, Unfortunately, you cannot see on the bottom, but uh, what happened is that Tencent actually bought China Music Corporation. So Tencent was able to combine QQ Music, Kual, and Kugo. So Tencent actually controls 77% of the streaming market in the US. Um, so 39% is QQ Music, uh, Kugo is 29%, 10% goes to Kual. Then you have uh, Xiaomi, which is, oh, no, actually NetEase, Wangyi, which has about 9%. You have Xiaomi, which has 4%. Um, Alibaba uh, was not very aggressive in licensing music, and so a lot of the music was removed from the catalog, from the catalog offered through Xiaomi, and so they went from being a major provider to being really second tier, third tier. And the rest are 9% um, is all the rest of the streamers in China. And I wanted to give an example. So when people are buying, so, you know, there was, I was always told, well, no one's gonna pay for music in China. Why would people subscribe and pay for a subscription? Uh, in China, of course, all the services do offer free ad-supported uh, streaming, uh, except for Apple. And Apple Music is actually the only non-Chinese music service in China. And that's likely to stay, Spotify is not likely to get in. Um, one is that, uh, of course, offering higher quality music, so higher definition, higher quality music when you're getting a subscription service, but also offering, offering um, exclusives. So Stephanie Sun is a pop singer, a mando pop singer from Singapore, and uh, she gave to Apple Music an EP, Rainbow Bot, exclusively, and as well as doing a three-minute documentary about her EP and about becoming a mother, because that was kind of the theme of the EP. Um, interestingly enough, the single uh, Rainbow Bot was available exclusively originally for Apple Music for four months, but then they had to reduce it to one month and make it available to the other platforms, largely through complaints of people who said, why do I have to pay the Apple Music? Uh, why can't I test it out? It's too complicated, etc. cetera. Um, but the, out, the EP itself uh, remained exclusively on Apple Music for a year. And the EP was ranked four out of the five can't miss Apple Music exclusive albums. So here we're getting a snapshot of the digital music listener. So again, 72% of Chinese population listen to music, 82% of millennials, 66% uh, do it through a smartphone, 69% of millennials. Uh, they listen on average 16 hours per week, a little more for millennials. And uh, you see that there is not just a propensity to pay for a subscription, but it's a propensity generally. So for example, Beats headphones, which are not cheap. Um, a lot of people, 24% are using specialized headphones, 28% of millennials. What's also interesting to look at is the tiers. Uh, everybody, uh, or a lot of the presentations have looked at tier one, tier two, tier three cities. So here I just wanted to give a snapshot. You can see that tier one and tier two actually are not very dissimilar 
when you look at uh, percentage that listen to music, the amount of hours they listen to, how they're listening to it. Uh, tier three, uh, of course, is where you see a difference, uh, but that, I think, is something that's gonna be catching up rapidly. Finally, and probably for brands, this is maybe the most interesting thing, and this is from Nielsen. Um, I think that what's interesting about this is how we would compare to uh, Western uh, listeners. Um, uh, music that's been around for 20 years, so I kind of have the experience of the US and Canada. Uh, we would have a much less uh, favorability in product placement and music videos, for example, or brand sponsorship for a tour. It depends, but there, I would say, less acceptability than what you would find with Chinese consumers. Um, I'll be talking about brands holding sweepstakes, for example, uh, brand offers for free music downloads, so you can, for example, think of uh, non-paying -subs non subscribers to QQ Music. This is a w great way for brands to be able to offer it to also free subscribers. So, I'm trying to go quickly. <laughs> so, what I think the music revolution in China is about, actually, is that, you know, if most people think of Chinese music, they're thinking of Chinese pop, then K-pop, but really the revolution to me is Yao Gun. Yao Gun is uh, the Chinese word for rock and roll, but I like to use Yao Gun to say Chinese rock and roll because it is quite distinctive from Western rock and roll, just like Brit pop is very distinctive to Britain. Um, I have, we did a major event last year at the China Institute in New York to celebrate 30 years, 30, 30th anniversary of Chinese rock. And that started with the man over there, Cui Jin, who performed uh, at the uh, International Peace Concert and uh, Beijing's Worker Stadium. And he sang his song, Nothing to My Name, which is iconic. Uh, he actually performed in Tiananmen Square and that kind of launched a revolution, an awareness about rock and roll. Um, in the 90s, you had a spattering of groups uh, like Cobra, which was the first female all-rock group, uh, Tang Dynasty, uh, several groups, but really things coalesced in the 2000s. And this is when a, f a club called D22 uh, it was started by a financial advisor called Michael Pettis, who had actually opened the club in New York in the 80s, then moved to China, uh, teaching at Beijing University. And he opened this club, D22, to give an opportunity for young rockers to be able to have a platform to play because no one would let them play. And what happened was really, literally a revolution. A whole generation of rock uh, musicians, when I say rock, it's everything from alternative rock to metal to punk, that really emerge out of this club. If you want an analogy for me, who's a New Yorker, it's like CBGBs. Um, the other thing that happened, including this genesis of new artists doing rock, was festivals. Uh, these are festivals that we booked our artists. Uh, we tour Western artists in China, and these are three festivals where uh, they had played. Midi festivals actually comes out of the MIDI School of Music outside of Beijing, uh, which was, uh, is now 24 years old. And they had originally started a kind of a reunion for alumni uh, in their cafeteria where some bands could play. Then that turned into a festival, the first real music, commercial music festival, rock festival. And it's kind of defined rock and roll in China. Um, and these are the bands I was talking about, in part, that came out of, 19, that came out of the D22 revolution. Uh, you can see punk, you can see actually Nova Heart, which has gotten very big outside of China. Uh, Brain Failure, uh, probably one of the bands that has toured the most in America. Uh, Van Warp Tour, for example. Some more bands. So the, what's incredible is that these, um, these festivals have really been a platform for promoting Chinese rock to a uh, youth generation. Um, you don't see it on TV. It wasn't played on the radio. This was the only platform, really, that they could be exposed through. Um, the festivals are, I always say the music festivals in China are probably the only platform where 100,000 young people can basically be themselves over three days. So your average festival might have 10 to 40,000 uh, uh, music fans who are attending per day. 
the biggest music festival organizer is Modern Sky that uh, holds about two dozen festivals uh, in first, second, and third tier cities across China. Uh, they recently expanded uh, to the US. They actually do a Modern Sky Festival on the West Coast and on the East Coast. And you can see the excitement generated and how these fans are really, you see the flags, these flags represent their favorite bands. And so they're waving them during the shows and et cetera. Um, the other thing that's important is that not just the festivals, but China also has quite an extensive touring circuit. And so this is of course very important for bands. Going back to the festivals, a lot of the bands from the D22 era actually are able to make a living from playing festivals across China, which I think for a lot of uh, Western bands, they would be jealous of. Uh, but there's also an extensive touring circuit, and as I had mentioned, we tour Western artists. These are four Western artists from Canada and one from the UK, Oberfuse, uh, that we toured in the fall winter of uh, last year. Uh, EDM, electro pop, rock, and indie folk world music. Um, so we toured, so these four artists toured in 44 shows in 19 cities. I think you can see the name of the cities. They range from first tier cities like Shanghai, Beijing, but all the way to, well, maybe a fifth tier city like Baoding. So all of these cities have live houses where they play. Here are some of the live houses that are better known in China uh, that we've uh, booked bands in. Uh, primarily in Beijing, Shanghai, Chengdu, Wuhan. But it's not just live houses, you need the partners. You need to have an infrastructure to be able to reach the fans, sell the tickets, engage. So we have everything here from online radio, digital distributors, um, promoters, online ticketing, and also VR, we did uh, some uh, virtual reality videos for some of our artists that are touring. Um, and live streaming is a really important part of it also. So we've done live streaming with Yemma Live, Panda TV, and Modern Sky Now, to name a few. Um, I especially would like to focus on Yemma Live, and for that, I have another video. <laughs> I have limited time, I'm not going to show you the whole video, but uh, Yemma Live uh, is an organized, the founder is actually, was the editor of Rolling Stone China. Uh, he was also the founder of Zhang Bei Music Festival and Yemma, uh, MTA Festivals, the video we saw. It's a music technology and art festival. Um, actually, one of the things that was notable was Alan Walker, um, who's quite well known uh, outside of China. Before MTA Festival, before he performed there, he had about 100,000 music fans after he had 1.5 million and 20 offers to play in various festivals in China, just to show how important it can be for Western artists also. Uh, but they're also an uh, online live music broadcaster. Uh, they live broadcast, they're the exclusive live broadcaster for MIDI Festival, which as I said was probably the most important rock festival in China. A uh, Jay-Z festival they work with, which is the biggest uh, jazz festival in Asia. Uh, Zhang Bei Music Festival, that's just to name a few. They also organized 30 shows last year, 15 lectures and five exhibitions. Uh, but they also do uh, original programming. So uh, Live is Everywhere is exclusive concerts in unconventional locations. And they've worked with artists like Gala, which is a very well-known band in the, in the mainland, and Xiaofeng. And uh, Yama Indie. 
So all our bands, when they come to China, uh, before they kick off their tour, they go into the Yemma Live studios and they do kind of like an in interview and a uh, set that they perform live on live streaming and that's part of the Yemma Indie, which introduces independent artists to music fans. Uh, their live streaming partners are, you can see, Xiaomi TV, Xiaomi Live, those are their main ones. Xiaomi is actually one of their investors. Uh, Le TV, Yuku, et cetera. They did 100 shows last year, 5,000 minutes of live streaming, an average audience of 50,000, 5 million total, 8 million with their partners. And you can see the uh, audience analysis. Uh, obviously, they are in that demographic, 19 to 35, one, uh, tier one, tier two cities. Uh, very active net users, active social life, love live music, follow celebrities, KOLs, and a willingness to pay money and spend time on entertainment and alternative lifestyle choices. And this is a campaign that they did with uh, Adidas uh, for the NMD uh, shoe and basically was like a sweepstake. So you entered it and there were 100 shoes being offered exclusively through this in Beijing and 100 in Shanghai. Um, but there's other big Western brands that are also working. Tubor, if you don't know, is a Danish beer. Uh, they entered China in 2012. I should look this way. Uh, and they started doing the Tubor music truck tour, and they did it with a, a Chinese promoter called Splatter, which is uh, actually part of uh, Splitworks, which does a lot of festivals as well. And in 2013, they also launched GreenFest. GreenFest is a kind of environmental focus festival that they've been doing in certain countries in Europe, and then they introduced it to China, working with Modern Sky that does the production, and did it specifically not first tier cities, but second and third tier cities, quite interesting. And they introduced a lot of things that had never been seen in uh, Chinese festivals, like the silent disco and tents. Uh, they did a five year, after that, in the next year, they did a five-year strategic partnership with Modern Sky and uh, actually did the electronic stage for the Strawberry Festival. The Strawberry Festival is the festival I was mentioning that there's about 20, 24 festivals happening across China uh, every year. I'm going to skip this video, sorry. Uh, and so I spoke about rock and how rock has grown from really a small grassroots and being major with all the, uh, the a major movement across China, EDM has done it even quicker. Uh, Budweiser Storm Festival, uh, A2 Live is a, a music promoter. They did an electronic music festival, and then Budweiser signed on. Um, so you can see some of the, what's important here, one, Budweiser has invested a lot with A2 Live in creating awareness on EDM. Uh, people in China did not really have a lot of knowledge of ADM, and so getting the um, brand sponsor involved in educating was very important. Uh, they also did an online reality boot camp show, basically where they would get budding DJs, put them through a four-week boot camp, and the one that was chosen would play on the main stage of Storm Festival. And it is some interesting gamification. So basically you can queue in line to buy tickets, but KOL, they would partner with KOLs to basically call people to do different tasks that would allow you to jump in the line. Uh, what was interesting with EDM, the first time they did the festival in 2013, they realized that Westerners had a much higher knowledge of EDM, and so they, uh, about 50% of the tickets were bought by foreigners, 50% by Chinese. The next year that changed dramatically, 70% were bought by Chinese, 30% by, by uh, expats. Uh, so you can see that the education move was very important. And I'm seeing, so I'm just going to flip. I'm just going to give this, the last thing I'm going to talk about. It's not just big brands. Um, Body Memory, uh, you can see their logo. They do live casting of body parts into jewelry. Uh, it's a designer based in uh, Beijing called Joey. Uh, Secondhand Rose is the biggest uh, rock band in China. And uh, they hadn't they'd done a, a major concert in Gonti. You saw it clipped in one of the videos. But they hadn't really done a major concert in, in Beijing for three years. So they decided Valentine's Day would work because it's called Secondhand Rose. And they worked with Body Memory to create exclusive, uh, um, uh, basically, live casting of the lead singer Liang Long's hand with two things. Two hands put together for love and one which is the iconic secondhand rose hand symbol. Um, they promoted on WeChat and Weibo. They, sold, they were sold for about 1,200 RMB, 
they sold out, and because I think it was really a way for people to own a piece of their favorite artist, uh, because it was a live casting of his hand. With that, I want to thank you all, and I am in the time. <laughs>